Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, May 16th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I am recording from San Diego, California. Monday afternoon, we lowered our Infocon status back to green. There was no real significant additional news about the WannaCry ransomware. Things are pretty much back to normal. Now, so far, no significant new variants were released. One of our readers noticed that Shodan's account of systems that expose SMB on port 445 actually went went down from about 2 million to 1 million. So while it's still a large number, it looks like the worm at least helped to significantly reduce the number of exposed systems to this and other exploits. Note that even before WannaCry, uh, these systems were at risk of exploitation and many of them likely had already been exploited. There were a number of different scans of, for example, the double pulsar backdoor that showed that uh, this particular backdoor, which was of the signature of uh, this exploit being used here, had been deployed to numerous systems even before WannaCry came out shortly after Shadow Broker did release the details about the exploit. Apple today released its usual unscheduled updates of everything. The update affects OS 10 El Capitan and Yosemite, as well as Mac OS Sierra, Safari, iOS, TV OS, and of course, Watch OS. Since uh, different operating systems share a lot of common code here with Apple, the vulnerabilities being addressed are very similar uh, to each other. WebKit uh, is being updated across all the operating systems and one of the major sources of the about 40 or so different CVEs uh, that are being addressed here. And probably WebKit is also the most critical component and many of the vulnerabilities addressed in WebKit expose users to arbitrary code execution and of course all it takes is visiting a malicious web page. A couple of SQLite vulnerabilities that uh, are also being patched here are also exploitable via the web browser. Of course, SQLite is typically used, for example, by cookie storage and uh, other various components that store data in web browsers. For Windows users, Apple is updating iTunes and uh, also the iCloud client uh, for Windows. Both of these components also use WebKit, so that's uh, one of the vulnerabilities being addressed here. The popular VPN software OpenVPN underwent a thorough code review by Cryptography Engineering. The code review took place between December and February and inspected was the latest version, of course, uh, version 2.4. Now, luckily they found actually very little uh, to worry about. Two vulnerabilities were rated as medium severity and the rest was rated as low severity. The medium severity issues should be already fixed. Now the low severity issues, they try to address them in the next uh, normal update. But uh, some of them, for example, are just uh, that there are still some weak configuration options available. So by default, you're okay. But of course, if you are using these weak configuration options, then you may have a problem. Shouldn't uh, really sort of affect the normal uh, use of OpenVPN. Always good to see when open source projects undergo these code reviews because, well, we always talk about that uh, open source should be more secure because uh, people are able to review the code, but it hardly ever actually happens. And an Italian developer looked closer at the tracking device provided for his car by his insurance company. According to the blog post by the developer, the device was provided in exchange for a discount and it enables the insurance company to monitor his driving habits as well as enables them to locate the car in case that it should 
be stolen. Now, I've seen similar devices provided by insurance companies here in the US. Uh, they usually connect uh, to the car's ODB2 board and uh, then do use, for example, SMS messages or some kind of cell phone interface in order uh, to communicate data back. In this particular case, uh, the insurance company also provided an app that allowed the customer to track the car's location. Now, this developer uh, did take a closer look at uh, the communication between the app and the web service that is actually feeding data to the app. He used a proxy to do so. And as it turns out, the web service does, first of all, not use TLS and overall really appears to be refraining from using any kind of meaningful authentication to retrieve data about the car, in particular the location. The only personalized parameter was the customer's license plate number. In return, the web service will respond with the last 20 known locations for the car. But the problems didn't really just end with the mobile app. He then looked at the web application that can also be used to track your own car. And it actually showed that there are other API functions that are being accessible that will essentially allow an attacker to retrieve any location in the past of the car, but also additional information about the driver, like for example, the make model of the car and the name of the driver. The blog does not identify the actual device or the insurance company, but he did mention that he did notify the insurance company and the insurance company updated the app. Actually, it's using a new API now that does a better job in authenticating these requests. The old API, if I read it correctly, is still available actually, but is supposed to be retired shortly. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.